What a beautiful, beautiful way to introduce uh, the message of this morning. I uh, don't often work with kids, but uh, during day camp, I was, uh, I had a, a group of kids that would come in um, hour after hour, and uh, usually they were around 13 in size, and my, my task was to guide them in taking apart things. And I would say, don't smash things apart, it's take apart. But uh, uh, we noticed after the first day, so all the things that you'd brought, uh, kind of thing, there was a lot of stuff, right? And uh, there were, there were uh, a lot of radios and a lot of different speakers, and I showed them where the magnets were and all those kinds of things. And, and everything was put together with screws, or else you just kind of pry it apart and break it, and the kids were having a lot of fun. And I noticed that uh, we didn't have enough screwdrivers, or the, the ones with the cross, or the Phillips. And so I went through my toolbox, and I brought all the different screwdrivers that I had, and and uh, on the third day of, of our session, uh, this little kid came up to me, and we were making little mobiles out of the things that they'd taken apart, a lot of circuit boards and so on. And uh, he held up this mobile, and he says, man, I got all these, all these screwdrivers attached to my mobile here. <laughs> and I realized that my multi-bit screwdriver was all taken apart and on the floor, <laughs> and all the screwdriver bits and pieces were hanging. I said, great job. <laughs> great job. <laughs> great job. So uh, that was fun. Take it apart, garage, yes. Our summer series on Old Testament stories. We've looked at Abraham with his convincing faith. We've looked at David. God is real and relevant. And Esther, things are not always as they seem. And then Manasseh, his mercy is more. Today we're going to look at the character of Caleb. You may not be, or you may think you're familiar with Caleb, but I think you'll discover some things that are new to you. They certainly were new to me. I've called this uh, Caleb or the inheritance. Uh, you know, some people work hard for their money and others just inherit it, right? In case you're interested, the largest inheritance up to now, is from Sam Walton, the founder of Walmart. When he passed away, he left his oldest son $190 billion, with a B, dollars. I don't think he's hurting for money. Uh, the most interesting inheritance I found a few. Maria left $4 million to a stray cat that she found in Rome. Um, love to be her cat, huh? Or how about Leon Hemsley? Hems Holmesley left $12 million to her dog named Trouble. The most unique uh, that I found was a man in the UK who left 26,000 pounds in trust for Jesus Christ to return, but he has to claim it in 80 years. We'll see if that happens or not. Unfortunately, I've had at times to intervene in family disputes over disagreements among family members who got what uh, they didn't want in a will or didn't get as much as they wanted. And in some cases, it has left deep hurts in families. So inheritance can be a blessing and a curse. Uh, it can hurt and uh, be troubling within family members. My advice is be careful what you leave to your children. And we'll talk more about this inheritance. Well, here in Joshua chapter 14, if you want to take your Bibles and turn to Joshua chapter 14, our passage of the morning, we'll start there, but we'll also go to Numbers to fill in some of the gaps. So Joshua 14, these are the inheritance of the people of Israel received in the land of Canaan, which Eleazar the priest and Joshua the son of Nun and the heads of the fathers' houses of the tribes of the people of Israel gave them to inherit. Their inheritance was by lot as the Lord had commanded by the hand of Moses, for the night and one-half tribes. For Moses had given an inheritance to the two-and-a-half tribes beyond the Jordan, but to the Levites he gave no inheritance among them. For the people of Joseph were two tribes, Manasseh and Ephraim, and no portion was given to the Levites in the land, but only cities to dwell in, which their pasture lands for their livestock and their sustenance. The people of Israel did as the Lord commanded Moses. They allotted the land. Then the people of Judah came to Joshua at Gilgal, and Caleb the son of Jephi the Kazite said to him, You know what the Lord said to Moses, the, God, the man of God, and Kadesh Barnea concerning you and me. 
I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land, and I brought him word again as it was in my heart. But my brothers who went up with me made the heart of the people melt, yet I wholly followed the Lord my God. And Moses swore on that day, saying, Surely the land on which your foot has trodden shall be an inheritance for you and your children forever, because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. And now behold, the Lord has kept me alive, just as he said these 45 years, since the time that the Lord spoke this word to Moses, while Israel walked in the wilderness. And now behold, I am this day 85 years old. I am still as strong today as I was in the day that Moses sent me, and my strength now is as my strength was then, for war and for going and coming. So now give me this hill country of which the Lord spoke on that day, for you have heard on that day how the Anakite were there, and with forti- great fortified cities. It may be there that the Lord will give, be with me, and I shall drive them out, just as the Lord said. Then Joshua blessed an, him and gave, gave Hebron to Caleb, the son of Jephthah, for an inheritance. Therefore Hebron became the, the in, inheritance of Caleb, the son of Jephthah, the Kezite, to this day, because he wholly followed the Lord, the God of Israel. Now the name of the Hebron formerly was Kerith Arabah, Arabah was the greatest man among the Anakim, and the Lord had rest, and the land had let rest from the war. Thus far, God's word. Just to catch you up on where we are before Joshua 14. So if you were to thumb back between in chapters 1 through 5, we find the commissioning of Joshua, who now takes over from Moses, who has passed away, and he says, be strong and courageous. It's also where Israel uh, crosses into the promised land. And it also is a rededication of the new generation that now is going to be the first generation that's of age because all the rest have died. In chapters 6 through 12, we find the fall of Jericho. We find the first defeat as well in Ai due to the sin of Achan. Joshua renews the covenant with the people. Mount Ebal on one side, which is to look and is barren to show that if they do not follow the promises of God, they'll be barren and they'll be cursed. And Mount Gershom, full, lush, beautiful mountain, showing if they are following God, they'll be blessed. The sun also stands still in one of these chapters during a decisive battle and the conquest of Canaan. Chapters 13 through 24 is the division of the land in the different tribes, the cities of refuge, the renewal of the covenant. And the book ends with a question. In 2414, choose this day whom you will serve. An important question that we have for us today as well. And then in chapter 14, of course, is Caleb's story. Well, let's look at his story. Uh, Take your Bibles and go back to Numbers, if you'd want to go to Numbers 13. This is the first mention that we have of Caleb in verse 6. So Caleb seems to be a chief or a tribal leader within the tribe of Judah. In verse 6, it says, from the tribe of Judah, Caleb. Um, And so that's really the introduction that we have of him. He was chief among the tribe of Judah. And in verse 2, we note that uh, Moses is now commanding that the people be sent out as spies. And so he says, choose from among you 12 spies that are leaders within the 12 tribes. And one of them, of course, is Caleb. And you have a whole list now of the names of the people that were to be spying into the land of of Canaan from Kadesh Barnea. And I'm sure they sent the best of their tribe, right? And that was the chief. I mean, can't you hear uh, Moses say, okay, send your volunteer. Send the best you've got. You'll infiltrate the hostile territory. We don't know what you'll find, but if you're caught, we're not coming to rescue you. You're on your own. Uh, and so send your best. Can't you see the 12 tribes, the 12 spies heading out? And uh, 40 days later, uh, if you look in verse 25, it says, In the end of 40 days, they returned from spying out the land. I'm sure people were just waiting, waiting, right? Every day I'm sure people were going, have they come back? No, not today. They come back today. No, they haven't come back. And you kind of, I, this is how I picture it, the, the ten kind of slinking back, you know, they looked defeated, they looked like, oh, we can't do it. And then Joshua and Caleb coming back with great vigor and with great strength, 
and carrying a bunch of grapes and fruit from the land, it says. And I'm sure they must have high five and people saying, we can do it with God's help. We can take the land. We can do it. Verse 25 through 26, you have that passage there. And they came to Moses and Aaron and all the congregation of the people of Israel in the wilderness who were param at Kadesh. And they must have all assembled, right? This was going to be the litmus test. This is what was going to show them what was going to happen. But look at verse 28 of Numbers. It says, however, the people who dwelled in the land are strong. So this was a report of the ten spies. And the cities are fortified and very large. And besides, we saw the descendants of Anak, and they were huge and giants, and we, can, we can't do it. We can't take the land. But look at verse 30. But Caleb quieted the people before Moses and said, let us go up once and occupy it, for we are well able to overcome it. 31, then the men who had gone up with him said, we are not able to go up against the people, for they are stronger than we are. So they brought to the people of Israel a bad report. And brother, they lied. They didn't tell the truth because of fear. They had spied out and saying, the land through which we have gone to spy out is a land that devours its inhabitants and all the people that we saw in it are of great height. So great fear was part of what was happening. So Caleb and Joshua must have faced the dilemma. Are we going to cave in and bow to the opinion of the other ten? Or are we going to stand out? What a dilemma, right? To stand true to God or to bow to others. And Numbers 30, right, we said, but God quieted the people and said, this is what God has revealed to us in spying out the land. Now look at the result of that report. Uh, 14 verse 2 in Numbers it says, And all the people of Israel grumbled against Moses and Aaron, and the whole congregation said to him, We should have just died in Egypt. We should have just been left there. Uh, In verse 4 they said, Let's choose another leader and let's head back to Egypt. You know, I keep thinking, they were slaves there. It wasn't a good time in Egypt. But they kept wanting to go back. I wanted to go keep going back. Verse 6, And Joshua the son of Nun and Caleb the son of Jephni, who were among them, those that had spied at the land, tore their clothes and said to the congregation, No, the land which we passed through to spy out is exceedingly good land. If the Lord delights in us, he will bring us into this land and give it to us, a land that flows with milk and honey. Only do not rebel against the Lord. And do not fear the people of the land, for they are bread for us. Their protection is removed from them, and the Lord is with us. Do not, be, do not fear them. Now remember, they had just experienced God's hand with them all through the desert. They would experienced the hand of God in so many different ways, and yet there was great doubt. Caleb had courage. It takes guts to stand up to an angry mob. It takes courage to spy out the land, thinking that you'll be discovered. It takes a lot to be a vocal minority. Try it sometime in your college class or in your, on the sky train or at your job. It takes, it, it's a lot more fun to be part of the majority than to be part of the minority. I still remember the first time that this happened to me. I was working as an 18-year-old in a Gould factory down in Fort Erie, in a part of Ontario, and we were making batteries kind of thing. And so I'd try and share my faith. I had a little testament that I'd read during lunchtime. And I'd been sharing my faith with a guy called Job. And I remember entering into the lunchroom, uh, maybe 100 people, 150 people there. And, and uh, Joe called out and said, hey, preacher Ray. And the room just got all quiet. What's your message for us all today? Uh, God loves you, Joe. And exit to the left. Out the door I went. Everybody laughed as I left. It takes courage be part of the minority, doesn't it? Caleb's inheritance. Let's go back to Joshua chapter 14. So Joshua in in 14.1 refers back to Numbers 26 and 34, where Moses has instructed how the inheritance is to go. There are to be three people present uh, at this dividing up of of the land. There's the Eleazar, There's to be Joshua and the 12 representatives of the tribes. 
It says in verse 1, These are the inheritance that the people of Israel received in the land of Canaan, which Eleazar the priest, Joshua the son of Nun, and the heads of the fathers' houses of the tribes of the people of Israel gave them to inherit. So this was done by lot. I'm going to put a map up on the back here where you can see how these tribes divided. And you can see how there were two tribes of Manasseh. Uh, There was also Ephraim, which was the tribe of Joseph. And if you notice, if you could quickly look at it, you notice that Kadesh Barnea is down in the bottom of this, way down past Simon. Actually, I guess it's not on the map. And if you go up uh, past the Dead Sea there, you find Jericho. You also find just above Jericho, Gilgal, where this is taking place. So this is how the land was divided. Now, do you notice at that map, there's one tribe missing. The tribe of Levite. The tribe of Levite does not have an inheritance. In fact, in Joshua verse 3, it says, For Moses had given an inheritance to the two and a half, one half tribes beyond the Jordan, but to the tribe of Levi, he had given no inheritance among them. Now, why would that happen? Why would Joseph get Manasseh and Ephraim and the Levites not get a tribe? There's a very good reason they didn't want, the, the Levites were the, where, where the priests came from. They didn't want them to be so, so interested in their own land. They didn't have to fight for their land. But rather they were given an inheritance of uh, the benevolent. In other words, as people brought to the temple the cows and the other things for sacrifice, the, pre, the Levites would get an inheritance from that. So that was their inheritance. So as they did this, in verse 5, it says they obeyed God and all these things. Well, the next is God's, or Caleb's big ask in verses 6 through 12. Then the people of Judah came to Joshua at Gilgal, which is just north of Jericho, as I said. And Caleb, the son of Jephni, the Kesetite, said to him, Joshua. So Caleb belongs to this tribe of Judah, and he gets an allotment. So Caleb is the first to receive the reward, and Joshua ends up in chapter 19, the last to receive his reward. These men of Judah were a strong force. They were one of the bigger tribes. In fact, they had 27,000 soldiers that they could muster. So they were kind of the, the head of the spear in going into Israel. Look at or Canaan. Look at verse 7. He, uh, Caleb's faith. He says, I was 40 years old when Moses, the servant of the Lord, sent me front from Kadesh Barnea to spy out the land. And I brought him word again as it was in my heart. He was 40 years old, and he's claiming now that promise. 45 years later. What are we like when we ask things from God? We say, God, it's been a week. Oh. Huh? How come you're not answering my prayers? Or maybe it's been a month. Or maybe it's been longer. Imagine that Caleb believed the promises of God 45 years. We don't have any record of God reinstructing Joshua. We don't have any further information but Caleb holding on to that promise. Now that is faith, isn't it? He is saying, I believed then and I believe now. Do we say that as we grow? We often grow cold in our own belief, don't we? In verse 8, we find, But my brothers who went up with me made the heart of the people melt, yet I wholly followed the Lord. So they spied out the land. They were terrified. The giants were strong. The ten spies reported that there were giants in the land. They were big and tough and bad. And guess what? They didn't want to leave. They didn't say, hey, come on in, guys. You can have our land that we've worked all these years. No, they wanted to stay. And yet Joshua says, no, I'm going to be tougher than you. The ten tribes, the ten spies said, let's just go home. Let's just go back to Egypt. Now look at the word that is used in verse 8. Yet I wholly followed the Lord. That's an interesting phrase, isn't it? W-H-O-L-L-Y. It's also given to us in Exodus 28 and 29, and it means consecrated or set apart or sanctified, or fully and completely in on it. 
totally get it dedicated to something. Caleb is using this description, saying, I want to wholly follow the Lord. And you have it in verse 8, you also have it in verse 9, and you also have it in verse 14, that he was wholly following the Lord. He was all in. Nothing on reserve. So here's Caleb, 85 years old, when he remembered, reminded Joshua of the promise that Moses had given him to give me this hill country, the hardest part, when they reached the promised land. You know, as I read Caleb's story again, which first mentioned in Numbers 13 and 14, and then also in Deuteronomy, and then particularly here, to read the context of how he wholly followed the Lord. And I have to ask myself, where am I in this? He followed the Lord wholehearted. There was nothing half-hearted about him. There was no sometimes I'm hot, sometimes I'm cold, sometimes I'm there, sometimes I'm not. He wholly followed the Lord. What an example to me. Maybe you think, well, I'm not quite there yet. Well, Caleb is an example to all of us that we need to be wholly in on following the Lord. I know people, you know people, right, who follow the Lord kind of half-hearted. They kind of show up, they kind of don't. God is asking you to show up, to wholly give your life to Him. Whatever vocation He's directed you in, wholly follow the Lord with all fervor, with all zeal. Nothing held back. Now, isn't it interesting, as you think about the story back in Numbers, when they give the report, he and Joshua had to go back to the wilderness wanderings because of the ten spies reporting that they couldn't take the land. Forty-five years, Joshua and Caleb had to live with that decision of the people rebelling. He had to listen to the gripes and the murmurs and the complaints against Moses and Aaron and the leadership. How in the world was he going to be faithful when the people that surrounded him were anything but faithful? How would he be faithful when the people desired to go back to Egypt again and again, grambled about manna when he had seen this wonderful fruit that the land produced 45 years? He had to obey. How would he obey when the idolatry crept back into the camp? How would he stand strong when the people Again, we're involved in sexual immorality or we're grumbling and testing the Lord. I'll tell you how. In the middle of it all, Caleb's heart was in Canaan. The promise that God had given him. The desert made him better, not bitter. He will endure the wilderness because he has an inheritance. He has a promise given to him 45 years and it sustains him through all that is to come day after day after day, wandering in the wilderness, eating manna again and again and again. I mean, I'd be tired of manna burgers, wouldn't you be? Manna for breakfast and lunch and dinner. Same food again and again and again. And all the desert and the dryness does nothing for your complexion. I mean, it was a tough go for him. They had to outlive a generation of people that were 20 years and older. We also can be surrounded with people who will question the goodness of God. Is the Bible true? Are the promises true? Jesus made all these promises. Will they be kept? There will be giants of pain and disease and giants of disaster and giants of difficulties that will come into our life. Caleb wants to go back to the place that scared everyone else to death. The wholeheartedness of Caleb is summed up in one word, obedience. Obedience. When you're guided by fear, that's the voice you hear. When you're guided by pain, that's the voice you hear. When you're guided by faith, God's voice is what you hear. God, uh, Caleb's faith was simple. He believed the promises of God and said, that's good enough for me. I believe the promises of God. Ten spies match their strength against the giants to match their strength with God. A simple faith, believe in God, we can take the land. Didn't argue with God. 
He didn't refuse to be anything but pleasing to God, even when the majority said he was wrong. Look at verse 9. And Moses, he reminds him, swore on that day, saying, Surely the land on which your foot has trod shall be an inheritance for you and your children forever, because you have wholly followed the Lord my God. Forty-five years he counted on that. Forty-five years. He was given a promise. He never gave up. He believed it. Verse 10, you have the confession of Caleb. He says, And now, behold, the Lord has kept me alive. Maybe it was a close call at times. Just as he said, these 45 years since the time that the Lord spoke this word to Moses, while Israel walked in the wilderness, and now, behold, I am this day 85 years old. 85 years old. Wow. I know that, you know, I'm not as strong 45 years, you know, since I was in my 20s. You know, my hair has gotten lighter. Uh, My back creaks. My knees aren't as strong. Here he is saying, I'm as strong. In fact, I'm ready to go. 85 years old. I won't ask the 85s to raise their hands here. But I know from hearing your stories, you don't feel as strong as you did when you were in your 20s. And he says in verse 12, give me the mountain. Give me the mountain where the enemies are entrenched. He's asking for the mountain that caused all the others to turn away from following God. That which melted their hearts. Isn't that an interesting phrase in verse 12? It melted their hearts. It's almost like saying, send me to the toughest place in the world. And for us to be able to say, send me to Ukraine, or send me to Iraq, or send me to India. Send me to teach in a public school. Send me to a place where they don't like God. Send me to a place that doesn't believe in God. Because I believe in the promises of God that he'll be with me. Give me the place that it caused everyone else to give up on God, to quit, to stop. You know, for some of us, God doesn't give us a pain-free life. There's suffering. There's a lot of difficulty. It's been difficult life, or maybe a good life. These things can cause people to walk away, for their hearts are melted by fear. Even though we get older and our skin is more wrinkled and our hair is not as dark as it was, does not mean that you're too old for the the warfare business. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Well, Caleb's reward comes to us in verses 12b. So now give me this hill country of which the Lord spoke on that day. I want to proceed. I want to go. No matter what has happened in your life, maybe you've faced death or someone around you has died, you've had a diagnosis of cancer, God says, I'll be with you. Maybe your business has gone up. He says, I'll be with you. Maybe pain has torn your body apart. And he still says, I will stand with you. Faith requires that this is what God has said. Maybe your marriage is broken up. God will be with you. Verse 13, it says, Caleb took care of the giants that were in the land. Then, verse 13, then Joshua blessed him and said, Hebron to Caleb, the son of Jephthah for an inheritance. And as you read the rest of the story, he indeed did. And so there's a renaming of the place to Hebron, which means fellowship. And we find that Abraham, Isaac, and others are buried in that very same place. Caleb's inheritance was fellowship with God. Ours is companionship and compensation and fellowship with God. And it says, and the land rested. I want you to quickly turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 1, where we are given our inheritance. Ephesians chapter 1. Look at verse 11. It says, in him we have obtained an inheritance having been predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, so that we who were the first to hope in Christ might be in the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you have heard the word of truth, the gospel of of your salvation, and believed in him, were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until we acquire possession of it to the praise of his glory." You know, when it gets tough, remember, we have an inheritance. Like Caleb remembered the promises that he was given that he would take 
place, he would take a have, have a place in the promised land. So we have an inheritance, we have a home, we have an address where we will belong. And no matter how tough it gets, that should be enough. I know, life can be exhausting, right? And the closer we come to the end of our life, the better retirement starts to look. You know, you start to vision sitting on your back porch, you know, with some iced tea, your feet up kind of thing. You know, no kids around, just quiet, the cell phone's off. And you're just sitting there. Sunset, you know, music, cues up, right? Plays. Pretty appealing. But isn't it true that yet the things that seem to exhaust you also brings fulfillment. You know, working with those kids in day camp, I was tired at night. They're busy kids, right? And trying to keep them from stabbing the microwave in the wrong places. I mean, it was exhausting at the end of the day, but yet it was also so fulfilling. I think that there are times where we have been told the wrong things about retirement which offers up a life that, in fact, may be a step down. Where do you really want to end your life? Now, this isn't just for those that are going to be retired or are retired. You know, propped up on your porch, you know, with a do not disturb sign and an IV of iced tea going into your veins just isn't where life is at. Look again at Caleb in Joshua 14, verse 11. I'm still as strong today. God is with them. You know, as Christians, we're not called to a picnic. And somehow in your 60s or 70s or 80s, you're not given a hammock. You know, anyone can start a race. But who's going to finish strong? You know, the writer to the Hebrews was writing to persecuted Jewish Christians. They were persecuted to the extent of being turned out of the temple. They'd lost all that they'd been dear to them in the Old Testament ways. In Hebrews 11, we will have a wonderful list of the saints that followed God. And I love the phrase that says, and the world was not worthy of their obedience or their following. They gave it all up for him. Why? Because they had the promise of a home. You also, as believers, have the promise of a home. You have an address, as I said, in heaven and that is to come, and that's to take you through the tough times. You know, in Hebrews 12.1, we are commanded to throw off everything that hinders because we are in a race. And this race is not only for Caleb, but it's for each one of us. And we're to run that with perseverance. All of us who know and love our Lord Jesus are to run with perseverance, the race marked out for us. Hebrews 12, 2, we read that Jesus, the great high priest, finished the course, and he said from the cross, it is finished, I've completed the race set before me. Friends, you and I need to keep our eyes as well on Jesus. And if we accept his loving discipline and endure hardships without complaining, we will become to the end of a race to be able to say, yes, we've completed the task before us. Well, some lessons that we've learned from Caleb. The first one is that Caleb wholly followed the Lord. And I'm going to ask you, are you all in? We're not talking about vocation as much as where you are in your heart in following God. Are you all in? Or are you reserving something for something else? Wholly in. God honored honored Caleb's faithfulness. Number two, Caleb's obedience was in the context of a minority report. The vote, as you've heard, was 10 to 2. Favor of disobedience. It's easy to compromise or to operate out of fear. Then number three, Caleb's obedience was in the context of group rejection. People literally wanted to stone them. They took up stones, and God intervenes. The question you need to answer is not, can I die for him? Because no one's picking up stones and no one has a gun to your head. But you need to answer this question. Can I live for him? Can I live for him? And then Caleb's obedience continued for 45 years. Even though Joshua was the man chosen by God to lead the people, Caleb's obedience shines like a beacon 
honored and rewarded by God for being faithful. That's what I call a long obedience. God wants that from you. Whether you're 18 or whether you're 85, God wants you to step by step by step follow Him this day. You know, I, I, it seems like I can't preach or teach without talking a little bit about my mom. So my mom turns 65, and when she turned 65, the law of the land was that you have to retire. You have to stop working, or at least you can't get paid, right? So my mom had been widowed when she was 52. She had two small kids still in the home that mom and dad had adopted. So they made eight of us, but she had to go back to work. And so really had no pension gift, so she went to work in a nursing home. You know, at 65, I remember her talking to me, and she said, you know, Ray, I've been praying all these years that someone in our family would be a missionary, like an overseas missionary. You know, the full-fledged definition of a missionary. Two of us were pastors. I have a brother that lives in close to New York City, and he's a pastor there, and myself. But she said, no one became a missionary. She said, I've been praying and praying, so I will answer my own prayer request. I'll become a missionary. So at 65, I remember standing on the platform at Three Hills, that's where she had been working in a nursing home. And I was part of the commissioning service for my mom to go to Ireland. That was during the Troubles. That's when there was fighting between the Catholics and the Protestants in Belfast. And I said, Mom, would you at least stay out of Belfast? She said, no, Ray, I'll go wherever God leads me. And she went, she served for 13 years, till the mission organization said, you know, Margaret, it's time for you to go home. You're getting a little old, you know, you're living in a castle that's cold and you're creaky and it's not working out for you as well as you should. But all these years she served God faithfully. That's the legacy that she's left to us and our family. You know, the earthly possessions that she had when she passed away, you could fit into a cardboard box. What will you leave behind? She left us a great heritage, her eight kids and grandkids now, and generations down of her spiritual, wholehearted devotion to God. Or will you leave a pile of possessions that your kids and grandkids will fight over when you are gone? You decide now where your values are. Again, whether you're young or whether you're old, what inheritance will you be known for? That you wholeheartedly followed God? That you didn't allow the majority to sway you and your beliefs? Obedience to the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords wholly following the Lord? Or do you hope to just put your feet up and hope to not be disturbed? Or are you investing in the kingdom? You know, if you can fold your hands and bow your heads, you can pray. You can be involved in so many ministries investing in the kingdom of God. Don't be just sitting on the sidelines. Get involved. Be involved. God is asking you for a long obedience, step by step by step. And you know what? It starts today by what you desire in your own heart, to follow God wholly. Let's pray. Father, you've spoken to me through the man Caleb. And I ask that the Holy Spirit will apply this message to all of us that we will desire to wholly follow you no reserve nothing held back all in no matter where we may be working or what we may be doing help us to follow you fully no matter what the majority may say no matter if there seems to be group rejection. Help us, no matter what age we are, to say today, I will follow the Lord wholeheartedly. And we know that you will reward us. Thank you that we have a heavenly home that is there for us as a promise of our inheritance. May we long for that day, but may we be active, and may we occupy the land till you return or till we meet you upon our death. And so we thank you for this day and the promises you've given to us. In Jesus' name, amen. May you be blessed with God's word.